You know, you've heard of the Gold Yard Scholarship. These guys from Seal got put together years ago. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And now they finally got it into endowment status. So this this week they had the meeting and they, they gave the original people involved with it one of these pens and they showed us a picture with a certificate that it had been used to sign parts oh. of it. <laughs> Part of the document. document. Mm-hmm. They get this certificate of authenticity. They've been so funny. Several years ago, one of them has a job. One of his side businesses is selling trophies. So they gave all of us who were involved in it a big bowling trophy oh. <laughs> as governor for your work as governor of the Goldie Yard Scholarship. <laughs> When was that established? Huh? <laughs> Fifteen years ago, something like that. More than that. More than that, I think. Probably. No, maybe maybe fifteen. Maybe fifteen. Eighteen. Mm-hmm. Mid eighties, I think. <coughs> we have approximately seventy. Seventy. More right now. Yeah, my 25 year watch has lasted 10 years. I'm going to get another one next year. <laughs> is that what it is? For the next 10 years, another one? Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 That's no, better than if you put two in your watch. Exactly. You've taken the, the blanket and the yes. globe, <laughs> silver owl. Yeah, yeah. Right. Right. Good evening, and welcome to a panel discussion on the South, Religion, and Public Policy, sponsored by the Baker Institute Student Forum and the Baker Institute for Public Policy. This panel discussion will last approximately one hour, followed by the reception. Tonight, we have the honored guests of the Baker Institute round tables with us. The American South and religion are becoming increasingly interconnected as they affect United States policy, the rise of religious right throughout the South, and President Bush's own outspoken faith and Texas heritage testifies to the significance of this, this inter- interdisciplinary topic. We have gathered a distinguished panel of academics from Rice University to further discuss these issues. Our moderator for tonight is Dr. Alan Mattisau. He is a W.D. Twyman Professor of History and Associate Director of Academic Programs for the James A. Baker Institute for Public Policy. His academic interests cover recent American history, including the foreign policy of Nixon and Kissinger and post-World War II foreign policy. He is the author of The Political Economy of Richard Nixon and The Unraveling of Liberalism, A History of Liberalism in the 1960s. Professor Mattisau is currently working on a book on the Ronald Reagan presidency. He received his BA from Your Sinus College in 1958 and earned his PhD from Harvard University in 1963. Hence, I present to you tonight's moderator, who will introduce our panel, Dr. Alan Mattisau. First, I'd, I'd like to thank the members of the Baker Institute Student <coughs> Forum uh, for arranging this event. <coughs> they have. Um, organized themselves, really. They came to the Institute at the beginning of the year, and um, they offered their services. And what they've done is turn out students to our events. They've planned events. Um, they have been everything we hoped they would be. And I'd like to thank uh, uh, Dustin Stevens, who arranged uh, this event today, and all the members of the Baker Institute Student Forum for what they've done uh, for us during this uh, this academic year. They've been, they've been terrific. Um, the panel today is entitled South Religion and Public Policy. <coughs> it is, as Dustin pointed out, a uh, subject of more than ordinary interest today. And um, we have on our panel uh, scholars of national distinction to discuss this, this topic. As it turns out, these scholars happen to be members of the Rice faculty and are, are, are well known uh, to <coughs> most of you who are, are here. Um, what we'll do today is um, have each of the panelists present some remarks of about five to seven minutes. I'll ask you a couple questions, and then uh, we'll throw the floor open uh, uh, for discussion. So we'll begin today uh, with my colleague in the history department, John Bowles, who um, is a prolific author on the subject of Southern history. And uh, I can tell you from my own personal experience, has an astonishing knowledge of that subject. Among the books he's written, I'll mention just a few that are relevant to today's panel. He's written on religion in antebellum Kentucky, 
Masters and Slaves in the House of the Lord, colon, Race and Religion in the American South, The Irony of Southern Religion, The Great Revival, Beginning of the Bible Belt, and the South Through Time, a History uh, of an American Region. So, uh, John, would you um, come on up here and, and get this discussion started for us? Oh. Well, thanks. It's good to be here. Uh, I'm going to say some things that I always say that uh, seem to me to be important to say, but uh, that is, when we say the South, I mean, when we say the South, that phrase suggests a region of uniformity. <coughs> Uh, but the South is, a, is an extremely complex region and uh, has a different history and a different culture. But, I mean, the, the, the South, it's Virginia, is very different from the South, let's say, that's East Tennessee or from South Carolina <coughs> or from Florida or from Louisiana or Texas. So there, there's not a, even a South geographically. And then when we say the word the South, I'm assuming in, in this group when we say the word the South, we are implicitly meaning the white South. But, uh, you know, from before 1619, there have been significant numbers of blacks in the South, and it's really <coughs> difficult to talk about the South without talking about white and blacks living and acting and interacting together. And black Southerners and white Southerners have uh, uh, many differences of opinions, particularly in most recent years on s such matters as politics, and in fact, in such matters of religion. And then even in terms of religion, I mean, the South is no longer just a region, even the white South is no longer a region just of, say, uh, Protestants. Uh, there have, from the very beginning, been significant numbers of Catholics in the South. That's particularly true in states like Texas and Louisiana and Maryland and Kentucky and, to some degree, uh, Florida, and in growing numbers of Jewish Southerners and, you know, it, practically every other world religion. So when we, when we talk about the South, we have to sort of, uh, in some sense, de-aggregate the South. The South is a very, very complex region. People talk differently and eat differently and grow different crops and have different <coughs> urban rural mixes and vote differently. So the South is a very different place. Uh, unlike the other people here who basically do uh, 20th century uh, American history and politics and religion, I am sort of a, a century and a half out of date because most of my work deals with the period about 1750, 1850. So it's uh, uh, might be considered not very relevant. But it, it, if I were trying to talk about how Southern religion differs from Northern religion, and here just to be uh, to make generalizations, I'm going to be talking primarily about evangelical, white, essentially evangelical religion. If I had more time, I'd talk about black religion. But in the period I talk about, 1750 to 1850. The South is overwhelmingly evangelical, and I would I would argue that the Southern evangelical tradition is quite different from the Northern evangelical tradition. The Northern religious tradition, the Northern evangelical tradition, I would argue, is in some sense an outgrowth of Puritanism, and I think in the North that uh, evangelical Protestantism uh, leads in a very complex way to uh, reform. That as as the sort of the outgrowth of Puritanism swept across, swept across New York and across the Midwest. I would think, I would argue that religion, Protestant religion, led to social reform, led to social perfectionism, led to abolitionism, later leads to the, North, to the uh, social gospel. I would argue that Southern evangelical religion has had a very different sort of take, and I would argue that Southern evangelical religion has, has been primarily individualistic in orientation, that it has had a very narrow or very limited sort of soci sense of societal responsibility. I would argue that in the South, uh, religion uh, is very localistic. It tends to emphasize the conversion of the individual center and says that's sort of the end all and be all of religion. Uh, I think in part that has that that there are historical reasons for that. In the very beginnings of evangelical religion in the South, when the Methodists and the Baptists were first getting started, they were opposed to slavery and they were opposed to uh, uh, the planter aristocracy. And, of course, as you can imagine, in a region in which the planter aristocracy ruled the region, Southern Evangelicals, Methodists, and Baptists quickly ran into trouble for their being willing to accept blacks into their congregations and for their explicit and implicit criticism of slavery. So they often found persecution. 
the response that most of these evangelicals made is a response that to them made sense. To us it may seem caving in or hypocrisy, but basically th these evangelicals believe that the most important thing in their ministry was to bring what they call the saving gospel to the people of the South. And if they reason, if, if criticism of slavery or criticism of the planter aristocracy limited their ability to sort of preach, then they decided to sort of soft pedal or basically deny their uh, abolitionism or their anti-slaverism so that they could be able to, in their phrase, spread the gospel to the slaves and to the South. And so Southern evangelicals very quickly compromised in their sense, it's a prioritizing of principles, they compromise on the issue of slavery and they begin, they, they want to make absolutely certain that the planner political establishment understands that religion will not question, will not threaten dominant political and cultural institutions. Therefore, religion is primarily a private matter. They call this the spiritual, spirituality of the church. And their religion, they should, people should be absolutely content to understand that when they preach religi religious, uh, religion and <coughs> evangelicalism, it would not call into question any of the dominant structures of Southern society. So Southern religion, uh, evangelicalism, developed this tradition of not a very strong theology, emphasizing primarily individual conversion, and basically having no sense of responsibility larger than an individual life or maybe a congregation. Congregations were involved in what they called church discipline. But they, they, they distinguished the role of the church and said it, it primarily was a spiritual, private matter. As a result, Southern evangelicalism never developed the tradition of, of uh, social reform didn't lead to social reform, didn't lead to social perfectionism, obviously didn't lead to uh, abolitionism after the 1820s and 30s, did not lead to a very strong social gospel. And the only time that the Southern church is sort of, in some sense, compromised on this idea of the spirituality of the church <coughs> was in the late 1850s, they began to use their religion to defend the Confederacy and defend secession. And, of course, that turned out not to be a very happy occasion for them. And the lesson they learned is, look, once we, once we move beyond talking about individual conversion and address political issues, you see what happened. And so the result was an even more narrow definition of religion to just individual conversion. So I would argue that, that, that that's what a very, very strong distinction between Southern evangelicalism and Northern evangelicalism, the absence of a sort of a prophetic reform tradition. And Southern religion, I would argue, on the whole, has tended to be moralistic, not prophetic. And that's, that is, it's, it's, it's focused on individual, fairly narrowly defined personal sins rather than talked about the kind of institutional problems that cause major problems in, in society. And for that reason, I think, Southern religion, Southern evangelicalism, white Southern evangelicalism, in the 20th century never sort of addressed the kinds of political and social and cultural and racial <coughs> problems that we might expect <coughs> religion to focus on. In the last 20 or 30 years, there have been some change, but not very much. Uh, so... From my perspective, then, <coughs> Southern evangelical religion has been a major contributor to the sort of overall political and social and cultural conservatism of the American South. Thanks, John. Um, our next speaker is uh, Professor Earl Black. He's a Herbert S. Autry Professor of Political Science at Rice University. Uh, he is uh, one of the most distinguished scholars of Southern politics. He wrote his first book in 1976. It's called Southern Governors and Civil Rights. And subsequently, he published three other books, each with his brother, Merle Black. They are Politics and Society in the South, The Vital South, How Presidents Are Elected, and a book he published <coughs> last year, The Rise of Southern Republicanism. So uh, welcome. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to, to be here. Uh, time is, is, is brief, and so I'm surrounded by people who know far more about religion in the South than, than I do. So let me just talk a little bit about the, the role of religion in the political system of the modern uh, South. And this is uh, uh, very briefly taken from Chapter 8 of The Rise of Southern Republicans. Uh, has a 
I like the dust jacket. Uh, they've got a picture of a smiling Ronald Reagan, which is the great transformation for the Republican Party in the South. He, he, make, he puts a friendly face, a smiling face on the Republican Party. He's the Republican past. Up here at the top, I, to, I had to look, take my glasses off to see this. This is a picture of, of George W. Bush, the Republican future. This is the largest picture of President Bush who could get the Harvard University Press to put on the cover. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, <coughs> and of course, the jury is still out on, on, on the Bush uh, presidency. But let me just talk very briefly about what I think is important about the role of religion in the political life of the, of the South. In our party system here in the South, we have two competitive minority parties. We do not have a majority party in the South. Now, for the Democrats, that's a huge loss because until fairly recently, the Democratic Party was a clear majority party in the South. For the Republican Party to be a minority party is not really a change in their status. It's always been a minority party. But what is different about the Republicans today is that they're a much more competitive minority party. And I think the role of religion plays a very important part in the coalitions that both parties put together. I'm going to focus more on the Republicans here in this brief period than the, than the Democrats, but let me just say a word about the role of religion uh, on, the, on the Democratic side. I think the most important thing about the Democratic Party and religion is the role of the, of the black church as a source of organizational and get out the vote efforts for the Democratic Party. Uh, back in the days of the Civil Rights Movement with, with Martin Luther King's leadership, uh, it was from the black church that, that the leadership of the Civil Rights Movement largely came. And that remains a, a real focus of, of Democratic uh, success. And one way to think about the status of the Democratic Party in the South is, Without the support of, of blacks, the Democrats, I think, would be in a, in a very, very weak position. Blacks have emerged in the South and in the rest of the nation as the most loyal, large Democratic group in the country. And this has been the closest thing to a constant in our national politics since the presidential election of 1964 when Lyndon Johnson and Barry Goldwater represented very different uh, contrasts to the passage of the Civil Rights Act uh, that had occurred just in the summer of 1964. Uh, so I think especially today, uh, democratic success depends in, in large measure in most southern jurisdictions on <coughs> effective, well-organized, uh, enthusiastic black turnout, uh, and the, the, the democratic success there is generally on the order of at least 9 to 1, uh, sometimes 19 to 1, or perhaps even, even higher. Uh, there isn't any other large group in the United States that votes, uh, votes as overwhelmingly for the Democrats uh, as do, do, do uh, black southerners. Now, for the Republicans, as a, as a minority party in the South uh, forever, the Republican Party was invented as a party in the North. And after Reconstruction, the Republican Party uh, basically goes into, uh, into receivership in, in, in most of the South. The big Republican mistake of the, of the mid-1960s was to get themselves on the wrong side of the Civil Rights Act. Barry Goldwater's presidential campaign accomplished that. And it then put the Republicans in the South in the position of not being able to compete for more than token black support from that point to the present. So in effect, the Democrats are writing off 90 to 95 percent of a group that is getting larger and larger uh, as the decades uh, uh, progress. So how do Republicans win under those circumstances? The only possible way they can win is with large white majorities. The size of those white majorities varies from one state to another depending on the underlying uh, racial composition. But if you write off a substantial portion of the electorate, you got to compensate somewhere else. Now, for the Republicans, the basic reality is Southern Republicans started off primarily as a country club party, party of affluent whites. Now, that's not only a minority. <coughs> that's a very small minority. can't possibly make statewide majorities just with affluent whites. So the imperative for the Republicans uh, became finding a way to create large white majorities. There's no way that could be done just with, with affluent and middle class whites. Republicans needed to bridge the class line within whites. They needed to find candidates who could put together uh, coalitions that went from, I used to say, from the, the country club to Kmart. Well, Kmart's now out of business, so we'd have to say country club to Walmart. 
But basically, coalitions of affluent, somewhat affluent, and working class, low income whites. And it's in that context that religion became part of the Republican strategy. The Republican effort to broaden their coalition and to bring in uh, a conservative, religiously conservative whites uh, dates back to the Reagan presidency. That was done on a sort of informal basis in the 1980 presidential election. In 1984, the novel feature of, of, of Ronald Reagan's reelection was that the, the Reagan campaign went out and systematically organized the, the, the religious right whites. And that's how they made their presidential majorities. Now, what the Republicans wanted to do at the leadership level was to broaden their coalition, but they wanted the religious right whites on the bus, but not driving the bus. <laughs> and that became, uh, between 1984 and 1988, an increasingly a difficult pattern. And in 1988, who runs for the presidency but Pat Robertson? One of the leading televangelists, one of the leading symbols of the religious right white. Pat Robertson met his political death in the 1988 Republican presidential primary in South Carolina. And he was defeated, in a sense, he was lured into that state. Robertson thought, aha, South Carolina, easy victory in a Republican primary. He was lured into South Carolina and defeated by the Bush campaign under the political leadership of, of Congressman Carol Campbell and, and, and Lee Atwater, uh, uh, President Bush Sr.'s uh, chief political aide. They brought Reagan into South Carolina, they brought Robertson in, uh, and they out-organized and out-voted in a very easy way, and that was the end of Pat Robertson's fantasies about being president of the United States. But after the Bush campaign defeated Robertson, and how did President Bush Sr. position himself? In Greenville, South Carolina, he declared himself to be a born-again Christian. Now, President Bush Sr. is a born-again Episcopalian. <laughs> it's a political strategy. Needs the support, does not want to, to, to run off economic conservatives. And after the defeat of Robertson, the Bush campaign went out and made sure that Robertson was on the bus by the time the general election of 1988 rolled around, and in that election, uh, George Bush uh, defeated Michael Dukakis, uh, governor of Massachusetts, in every southern state, and in most elections, most states, it was not even, even close. Now, the current president of the United States, George W. Bush, is a born-again Methodist. You were raised in that tradition. You know that that's, that's a pretty mild tradition. But that, see that as, as a way for George Bush to combine the economic conservatism <coughs> that Republicans start with and is a common denominator with religious right whites, uh, and that's how the Republicans make their large majorities. I had a handout, and I vastly underestimated the size of this <coughs> crowd, so there are not many copies around, but, but this is taken from uh, Chapter 8 in this book. If you have this, I won't go into this in great detail, but it's an effort to look at the party system in the South in terms of five large groups, the social and economic foundations, ranging from blacks on the left-hand side as the most democratic group to Hispanics, uh, secular white women, secular white men, and religious right whites. <coughs> and what we see for the entire South is what we call in the book the Southern X. That is, the Democrats draw great support in the South from blacks and Hispanics. But when we get to secular white women, it's basically a pretty even battle. And then as we move to secular white men, the Republicans have a clear advantage, and they especially have a great advantage among religious right whites. And that, that Southern X persists in different ways when we move from the affluent whites or the upper class to middle class over here to the white working class. And let me just let's focus for a moment on the, what we call the, uh, an unsolid southern working class. These are low-income southerners. And in, uh, um, uh, because if the Democrats are going to put together a coalition of have-nots, they need to unite black have-nots with white have-nots. 
That's not what occurs in the South. We don't have a class politics here. And part of the reason we don't is the importance of the religious right whites <coughs> among low-income whites. Religious right whites are, are considerably more Republican than secular whites, uh, and, and that is one of the reasons why the Democratic Party has such a hard time building majority coalitions in presidential politics. And state politics and Senate races uh, depends a lot on individual candidacies. But the Republican uh, efforts <coughs> to, 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 to create a huge Southern uh, advantage is really the key to understanding our national politics today. Let me end on this. The transformation of the South from a solidly Democratic region, the old solid South, first in presidential <coughs> politics, now in congressional <coughs> politics, lies at the heart of our extremely competitive national politics. In presidential politics, the Republicans can carry the southern states. If they can carry all the southern states, <coughs> they only need 30% of the electoral vote in the rest of the country. If the Democrats lose every southern state, as they did in 2000, they will need 70% of the electoral vote outside the 11 southern states. Now, it's mathematically possible. It can be done. But I wouldn't underestimate the difficulty of doing it unless political events just create <coughs> a, a huge Democratic uh, opportunity. And in our congressional politics, in both the House and the Senate, the Republican breakthrough in the South in the 1990s has now made partisan control of both houses of Congress extremely close and competitive. That's one of the reasons why our politics is so shrill. You know, every time you look at C-SPAN, the floor of the House and the Senate, you see partisans shouting at each other. The reason they're doing that, at least one of the important reasons, I think, is <coughs> Every elected politician knows that they can either move from the minority into the majority or vice versa in every election. The Democrats, for a long time, <coughs> particularly in Congress, lived off of their southern surpluses. That meant that until very recently, the huge Democratic surplus that was produced by the South gave the Democratic Party, especially in the House of Representatives, virtually a <coughs> lock on control of the House, to a lesser degree in the Senate. That's all gone. And because of that, every one of our national elections, for as far ahead as I can see, is going to be uh, Hobbesian. Uh, you know, it's, it's going to be brutal on all sides because the stakes are now permanently high. And so it's the revival, I think, of a competitive South that brings this about. Uh, and if you're interested in the bigger picture, I, I, I suggest take a look at the, the general argument that we make here in the rise of Southern Republican. Thank you. Yeah, yeah thanks, sir. <coughs> Our concluding panelist is uh, Bill Martin. He's the Harry and Hazel Siobhan Professor of Religion and Public Policy in the Sociology Department. Uh, he's written um, a number of books. The ones relevant to our uh, discussion today uh, are Christians in <coughs> Conflict, which he wrote in 1972. Is that about Rochester and yeah. Saul Alinsky? Yeah. Yeah, I didn't realize that until I looked it up today. That was, I had to read that. Uh, his Could monumental. Be one of the few. <laughs> <laughs> Put you in an elite group. He's a very funny man. You have to listen to him carefully. Um, his, uh, his uh, great biography of Billy Graham called A Prophet with Honor, The Billy Graham Story, and uh, With God on Our Side, The Rise of the Religious Right in America. Bill? I'm going to get you to help me hold this up. Yeah. This is a map of uh, the year 2000. It's done every 10 years. And this <coughs> show, this is done with the Glen Mary Institute. They don't, you don't have to see everything. You don't have to be able to read the names of the counties. <laughs> but this is a, a map of every county in the United States. And those with solid colors means that one religious group has more than 50% of the people in that county belongs to it. Now, 
Blue is Catholic, and red, as it would not surprise you, is Baptist. So if you if you if you just thought there were lots of Baptists around your neighborhood, they're all they're all over. I had a, a Jewish girl from California in, in my class several years ago in a show in a similar match. She went, oh, oh. <laughs> she was absolutely taken aback. Now, if you remember from the elections, uh, the, the election maps that had the, the blue and the red done in, in much this, this same way. The red goes up, on up in here, but a lot of these don't have all that many people in them. You know, uh, Utah voted 80, the Mormons voted 88% for George Bush in 2000. But you've got, Wyoming has fewer people than are on the Katy Freeway on a Friday afternoon. <laughs> and North Dakota's its state motto is North Dakota, the land of lamb. So, um, but you get, you, you see here, that when we're talking about the religious right and white evangelical Protestants and what you're, what you've just finished talking about, it's really there's a big base to draw on here. So I think that's a, that gives a, a place to start here. Um, so we're talking about not all of those not all of those are white folk, but if we talk about the religious right, and I've done a lot of work on the religious right, and one of the qualifications for that is you really have to like white people. Uh, <laughs> but as, as a mark of the of the change that have come, it's just inconceivable that, um, say, a little over half a century ago, that Adlai Stevenson or Dwight Eisenhower would have thought it important to go to Bob Jones University to um, to, to you know stave off uh, stave off opposition. Um, but what Earl said about um, the <coughs> conservative pro uh, conservative Republicans the for the, really the new right, who were many of them secular, many of them religious, but many of the religious ones actually were Catholic and even Greek Catholic. But um, Morton Blackwell, who has been organizing uh, young Republicans since the since the Goldwater uh, election, said in the, uh, uh, in the late 1970s that evangelical Christians represented the largest stand of uncut political timber in the United States. And they set out to do some heavy logging and really went to Lynchburg, Virginia, talked, sat down with, with some other people, with, with Jerry Falwell, and one of these men, Paul Weirich, uh, gave the name Moral Majority to Jerry Falwell and said, this, this, you know, this is what you ought to call it. Falwell had said, there's a moral majority out there somewhere. And this guy said, what, what, what that term? And Paul Weirich said, what was that term? He said, that's what we're going to call it. That's, that's, that's the name for this. Um, but <clears throat> because they'd been um, long been part of the majority uh, in the South before the before taking this turn to the right, many of them, uh, well, in large measure, the the um, I think you can that as John pointed out, uh, white evangelical Protestantism is largely moralistic, and this means that they were very easy to turn by the changes in the late 1960s, early 1970s. Changes in sexuality, uh, abortion uh, changes, uh, changes in the taking out prayer and, and Bible reading in the public schools, all of these things that appeal very much to that individualistic, personal kind of morality, and also made them feel that they are, they are losing, losing touch with, with the country. It hadn't been necessary for many of them to, to be political activists uh, previously. Uh, many, in fact, many white evangelicals didn't even vote. Uh, Jerry Falwell registered, claimed to have registered seven million evangelicals who had never voted before for the 1980, uh, 1980 election, and virtually all of those would would vote in the in the same way. But um, there was a that a lot of this the fundamentalist. Uh, response is a is a response of feeling fighting against the threat, and if, a lot of the threat they felt was against the the, the moral aspects of their uh, uh, that th this this was being threatened. They hadn't had to fight so hard before because most of the country, other Protestants, liberal Protestants, the dominant culture was pretty much shared their their views. In fact, sometimes if you ask what is it do they want, well, they want the 1950s. There's a the, the the kind of the kind of attitudes that were taken that were taken very much for granted by most of the people that uh, that I knew when I was when I was growing up. Now, <clears throat> this is not, as you can see from that map, this is not an an, un, an insubstantial 
number of people. White evangelical Protestants represent, uh, comprise about 25% of all registered voters in the country. They're about one-fourth of the registered voters, approximately the same number, the same percentage as you have Roman Catholics and mainline uh, Protestants, other, other Protestant groups. That's three times the number of black Christians who are registered to vote, four times the number of non-religious voters, and 12 times the number of Jewish voters. So this is not a, this is not a, a fringe of American life. Now, of course, not all white evangelical Protestants are members of the religious right, but, or even regard themselves as Republicans. But the numbers who do uh, have been growing steadily. In the 2000 election, 47% <coughs> of evangelicals spoke of them, declared themselves to be Republicans. That's up from 26% in 1978, 35% in 1987, 42% in, in uh, 1996. So this is a, a steady progression. Of whether there's a cap on that, it, it's hard to say, but uh, uh, there, it's certainly uh, significant. 75% of white evangelical uh, voters voted for Bush in 2000. And if they attended church at least once a week, 88% voted for him, or 84%. 88% of, of, uh, of Mormons voted for him. 60% uh, of evangelicals say they feel close or very close to the Christian right. And of course, numbers are not the, the only important factors. Professor Black points out that evangelical uh, Protestants have been organized in such a way they tend to be, uh, to be, to vote, that, that a much higher percentage of them will vote than vote in the, uh, the vote in the, in the national elections. I don't know exactly what the, I forget what the percentage was in 2000, but in 96, two thirds voted of, of evangelicals voted compared to less than half of, of, the, uh, of the population at large, and of course they're part of that population. Uh, they are much more conservative on issues such as abortion, homosexuality, other so-called family issues than are most Americans, and uh, they carry that into the, uh, to the, to the foreign, to foreign policy as well. One of the reasons that the $3 billion or so that the, the United States held back from the from the UN for so long had to do with opposition from religious right forces to giving money to the UN because a part of that money would go for abortion or for family planning or, or for various various other kinds of activities of that sort. There is one other uh, one aspect that, that's worth mentioning here that's particularly pertinent at, at this time that uh, now it's pretty well, I think it's pretty well known, you probably know something about it, but it, it hadn't received a lot of attention until uh, fairly recently. And that is not uh, so personalistic and moralistic. And that is the belief of most, uh, or a high percentage of, of uh, fundamentalists and a higher percentage of people who were formerly evangelicals and have become more, uh, more hard line, that's the belief in the doctrine of dispensationalist premillennialism, which has to do with the end times. It is responsible for the sale of 35 million copies of the la of the Left Behind books. Uh, the the uh, about if you, if you, each one of these 11 books now has been on the New York Times bestseller list, and at, at times they've they've had it's had three of the 10 top books in America sells have been books that are novelistic treatments of this particular religious doctrine, and just to Hit, go right to the point of this, to, to make a long story short, a phrase whose origins are rambling and complicated. Um, <coughs> the, the, uh, to go to right the point here, the heart of this doctrine holds that before Jesus can come again, Jews must be in charge of all of Israel, all of Judea and Samaria. The, Al the, the temple must be rebuilt <coughs> on the Temple Mount, which means getting rid of the Al-Aqsa uh, Mosque and the Dome of the Rock which would, would cause lots of problems. Um, <laughs> and this also is, is a key reason why uh, evangelical Christians, apart from Jews, provide the strongest everyday lobbying pressure for the, the support, uh, not only the support of Israel's survival, but the support of Israel 
and the, uh, the the full support of the settlements and all those things. So it, it is a key factor in United States policy toward Israel. So whichever way you, uh, however you may feel about that, I think it's important to know that uh, that conservative Protestants are, are play a, a, a signal role in that. I think I'll just um, stop here. Well, I will say one more thing. This having to do with um, the role of, of religion and the role of, of this very conservative Protestant religion is that there is a, a sense of feeling it's not that it's exclusivist. They are willing for all sorts of people to agree with them. But there is, there is the sense that there is one right way. There's one right way to live. There's one right way to believe. There is, and that easily translates into there is one right kind of, of government. And often, this morning in the newspaper, I was an article about uh, Stephen Hotze, who is very much with the religious right. He talks about applying biblical principles to, to, um, to public life, to political life. And I think what many Protestants, what men, most Protestants probably for much of this country's life have, have thought was appropriate was to work for, not for a Christian nation, but a nation in which Christians and other people can practice their religion freely. That's a different thing from saying we're going to apply special revelation. We're going to base things on special revelation that has a that rather than on public uh, things that on public reason, things that can be that people of various faiths and, and no faiths can uh, talk about, which I believe is what the founders of the Constitution had in mind. And so I think there is a threat here to to pluralism. Um, fundamentalism, whether it's Jewish, Islamic, or Christian, is not very comfortable with pluralism. And the contemporary world is undeniably a highly pluralistic um, situation. And this, this is a, a tension that's not going to be go away, but we need to think extremely carefully and actively about how we manage to maintain it. Thank you. Uh, the next part of the program calls for me to ask questions of the panelists, but surprise, they went way over their limits. <laughs> and uh, so in order not to uh, waste time with my questions, it'd be, I think it would be more interesting to go right to your questions. So, um, uh, yeah. I have very basic questions. What is born again and what is the result? Oh, oh no, I, okay, I'll, 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 I'll have that. This was, by the way, uh, I was going to say something about what you said. When uh, um, Ronald Reagan was running for the presidency in 1980, early in the year, someone, this was the year that Charles Colson's book, Born Again, came out. The phrase had been around forever, uh, but um, John 3, 5. But uh, the, uh, uh, it has to do with Jesus said, if you, you, know, you, you, you must be born again. You must you can't enter into your, but you, you be regenerated. You become a new person. The phrase, uh, is, so it's, it's very much a phrase that is part and parcel of, of um, evangelical Christianity. But it means you're getting a new, you have had an experience, a religious experience in which your sins have been removed. You start, all, you start over as a regenerate person. Billy Graham talks about it. I remember in 1980 people saying, it's born again. Is that anything like the Moonies? No, it's more like the Baptists. Do you know any of them? Are they, do they frighten? Uh, but this book was held up to to Ronald Reagan. It says, "Is this? Are you born again?" And he he there, from those who were present said his eyes just came up like mirrored zeros, and he had no idea what it meant. But people took him aside so that he learned. One of the and uh, but the, by the time by the time he got to South Carolina, yes, he's a born he was a born again Christian. Um, Interestingly, George Bush, for whom the phrase was were, was also uh, not not very familiar, was taken aside by one Doug Weed, who made a video with him. They sat down and made a video in which they talked about and they asked him, "Are you born again?" He said, "Well, I haven't had this dramatic kind of experience, but have I? Do I feel like I've had a I know Jesus well and all this?" So he gave a, a, a an answer that would be satisfying ac around, across the board. And that video was played throughout Southern churches so that we'd know George Bush was a born again. And the same Doug Weed is now has been advising George Walker Bush 
and others who are give, telling him to say things like, there is power, wonder-working power in the blood, in the blood of the Lamb. That part, that was in the State of the Union speech. There are li these little things that, that show up from time to time that, that people are you know, telling him to salt in so that he sounds um, more evangelical than probably he, probably he is, uh, not to say that his religion is not sincere. Um, so the, uh, born, so you, is that okay for born again? And evangelical, the term is usually applied to those who, who believe that Scripture is inspired of God and pretty, you know, pretty reliable. They, whether it's absolutely, in, you know, inerrant uh, is another issue, but strong that who uh, have had a, a born again experience and who evangelize, who bear witness to their faith. So that that they are the the word evangel or who evangelion is gospel. You know, the the good news. So it's they are, they they tell about it. Questions? Uh, um, I wondered. I don't know who to direct this to, but I wondered if someone could talk a little bit more about the Carter presidency, uh, with Jimmy Carter being such a public uh, evangelical, but at the same time being a Democrat, as the South is tending toward Republicanism. Well, let me say a little bit. I, you know, we've, we've talked here about evangelicalism, and we've tended, I think, in the public mind to associate or identify evangelicalism with fundamentalism. And one of the great changes in this century has, I think, been sort of the fundamentalization of evangelicalism. So that in the early 20th century, up until, say, in the 1950s, when I was a boy growing up in the Baptist church, we were evangelicals. We were not fundamentalists. And we did not read the Schofield Bible. And we were not into dispensationalist millennialism. And, we never used the word rapture. That was all you know, just kind of far out kind of stuff. And uh, there was no sense at all of being sort of hard edge, rigid uh, theology. I mean, our church didn't even have a, a creed. I mean, we, we made a big deal about not having a creed and everybody being his own sort of interpreter of the Bible. So it sort of maximized freedom and so forth. And you were open to have a multiplicity <clears throat> of viewpoints. Uh, I think that is sort of Jimmy Carter's religion. That's Bill Moyer's religion. I mean, Jimmy Carter and Bill Moyers are, in some sense, 1930s, 1940s, 1950s, early 60s, evangelical Baptists who are not rigid or not uh, angry or don't feel that the world is sort of, you know, they're, they're not fighting against the world and all kinds of change and so forth. They're much more willing to sort of entertain a variety of viewpoints. The world is not sort of a series of good and evil binary opposites. And then in the 1960s, for some of the reasons Bill and others talked about, you know, the new contemporary issues of abortion and homosexuality and, and ch all kinds of political change in the South and the Southern, and then the rise of, uh, actually fundamentalism didn't begin in the South. It began in California and New York and Pennsylvania and sort of came to the South in the 1930s and 40s. And so, but it's basically taken over the South. And so now evangelicalism in the South tends to be fundamentalist and it's more argumentative. It's, again, I say hard-edged. It's more rigid. It sort of defines what you have to believe to be <coughs> saved. Or, and, and it basically is unwilling to accept the idea that there's sort of grays. I mean, there are sort of right and wrong, good and evil answers to everything. And, you know, that is a tremendous change in, in Southern religion. I mean, I, I'm actually no longer a Baptist, but I mean, the Baptist that I grew up with and the Baptist that, you know, that Bill Morris grew up with or Jimmy Carter grew up with doesn't really exist very much in the South anymore. It's been sort of lost. And I think one of the great unacknowledged, not much talked about social changes in the 20th century America has been that really significant change in evangelicalism. And so Jimmy Carter is in some sense then not at all a fundamentalist. I mean, he reads Ron Lever and all, all kinds of stuff. And he's willing to accept, you know, a huge range of issues. And Jimmy Carter is sort of, you know, not, doesn't fit into the modern evangelical world. Well, they liked him at first. They were excited about him coming off of the Watergate. They thought, here's a, wonderful, here's a wonderful candidate. He talked about teaching Bible and all that. And then he, two things. One, it turns out that he was a Democrat after all. Uh, he, 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 he was okay. He was positive. He thought abortion was uh, acceptable. And probably is more important than anything else, he did an interview with Playboy magazine. And, and you just, you can't do it. Such a thing as that. You're 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 dealing you're dealing with the devil. Um, it's interesting to say what also what you're talking about about fundamentalism taking over. The two large there are a lot of fundamentalists. Really, you've got 
Southern Baptists, independent Bible Baptists who are more fundamentalist than the Southern Baptists, We've got uh, the Presbyterian Church in America, the PCA, uh, and a lot of independent Bible churches. The, the Presbyterians, which of course were a much smaller group, the, the fundamentalist Presbyterians drew off from the, from the larger, more liberal denomination and formed their own group, and that happened right here at First Presbyterian Church in Houston maybe a couple of times. The Southern Baptists, instead of drawing off in a sectarian thing, took over. They, 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 they changed the, uh, the denomination and became much more, much more fun. And now the people who are drawing off are the moderates. Earl, you want to talk yeah, about Carter? Uh, you know, uh, I think Carter's interesting, uh, uh, and John is right here. Here's, here's somebody, you know, here's, here's one of the few, I dare say, few uh, Baptist Sunday school teachers in South Georgia who, who has heard of Ryan Hall Neely. <laughs> Well, you know, Card is much more cosmopolitan. His career, Naval Academy, submarine commander, et cetera, et cetera. He's very, very atypical. You know, I, part of his political ambition is to get out of Plains, Georgia, and, you know, find a way to govern Georgia, the president of the United States. <coughs> but I think fundamentally, you know, he turned out to be a disappointment for a lot of the people that he had mobilized uh, in the 1976 election. That was the last time that the Democrats carried the vast majority of southern states. Jimmy Carter in 1976 carried every southern state except Virginia. But he didn't carry the White South. Absolutely not. The White South has not gone Democratic since um, 1960. Uh, the Republicans, uh, the, the Democrats have never had a plurality or majority of white vote in the South, I think, since the Kennedy-Johnson election in, in, 19, oh. in 1960. And that, that is the underlying, see the big problem with Democrats is, and Carter is symbolic of it, um, the, the Republicans have a huge problem in, in because they cannot mobilize more than, than a, a token support among blacks. But the Democrats have this huge problem of the, of the this rather steady erosion of white support. It's more pronounced among white men than white women. But in the South, they're, unlike much of the rest of the country, there is not much of a gender gap between white men and white women. What far more important is, is how close they vote together. I think in 2000, I've forgotten the exact figures, but there's only about a six point difference in the percentage of, of the Bush vote among white men and white women. And in both cases, it's huge majorities to, you know, to, to begin with. That was not the case in, in other parts of the, of the country. And is that to answer? Thank you. Uh, is there any uh, threat or the concept of separation of church and state as a result of the rising influence of the religious right? Yes. I, th I think there's a, a significant, uh, uh, I mean, there are many people in the religious right are quite openly saying that's a false doctrine. There never was any separation of church and state. It never was meant to be that. It's, that's, that's, uh, that's foolish. Um, and it's, it's all, it, of course, is the case that I suspect that um, uh, the, the Thomas Jefferson and James Madison, the two key architects of this, never envisioned the kind of pluralism that we have, religious pluralism that we have. But I think if they were to come back and see it now, they would say, ooh, we were... We, we had no idea how right we were. And that, again, is one of the real significant <clears throat> changes the last 40 or 50 years. I mean, again, you know, evangelicals before, say, 1960 were extremely strong supporters of the concept of separation of church and state. It made a huge deal about soul liberty and so forth. Baptists. Baptists particularly. I mean, yeah. a, a Baptist, I mean, it was just, it was a, so the, maybe the defining Baptist right. viewpoint was separation of church and state. And then as they get more and more upset with the way sort of affairs are, and they become as fundamentalism takes over, and sort of you see the whole world and you know good and bad. Then if you if you only see the world in good and bad, or good and evil, then you you know you need to, you cannot if you if you don't do anything, evil's liable to take over. So you need you need to control viewpoints. You need to control the government. Whereas other more of the mainline Protestants have seen, they've been able to see a secular government as an instrument of God's way of governing, you know, that a secular government could be part of an overall plan without without feeling that it had to have a biblical warrant for everything that it did. We've been talking only about white religion. In the black church, I mean, I made this big deal about <clears throat> southern evangelical religion being individualistic and 
just oriented toward conversion and so forth and having no sense of social responsibility. The black church, the black church often in slavery was the institution that sort of buffeted slaves from the, you know, the hardships of life. And so the, the black church has for very traditionally had defined its role in all kinds of social ways. And so the black church today, has a, the black Baptist church has a totally different political viewpoint and it's not been taken over by this kind of you know, right-wing fundamentalism. So when we talk about Southern evangelicalism, we really have to distinguish between black and white religion because it's quite different. Yeah. Even though, I mean, in old-fashioned ways, I mean, there's no, you know, uh, when Jimmy Carter first began to uh, run and when he would go to places like Michigan, he would go to Baptist churches in Detroit because they kind of spoke the same language and so forth. But uh, Clinton. Clinton, too, yeah. Yes. Um, what it, why do you think the South, as opposed to other parts of the country, was more susceptible towards the shift towards fundamentalism um, that you're talking about earlier? Well, I you, I mean, maybe that's your thing. But it's, a, it's a very complicated kind of thing. One, one is the South, I think, uh, had uh, it was less pluralistic, I think, than the rest of the nation. I mean, it was it was overwhelmingly evangelical. And it was it, it, it had tended not to be as affected by change as many other parts of the country. It was more rural. It was less educated. And uh, so when change, but when social, political, cultural change began to happen in the 1960s, it was more shocking. And the, and the, the you didn't have you didn't have Catholics and Jews and a whole wide of range of you had you could grow up in the rural South and never know anyone who was not evangelical. I mean, the town I grew up in, there were no Catholics, there were no Jews, there were not even Presbyterians or Episcopalians. Everybody was Methodist, Baptist, or Pentecostal. You know, so uh, uh, it didn't take much change for my, people in my world to think, good gracious, the world's going to, you know, to the dogs. And so you respond to that in critical, defensive ways. Now, the fundamentalist modernist controversy in the second, second third decades of, of the 20th century really took place, as he said earlier, in New York. I mean, Princeton. Princeton was right. the was the... The, the rock bed of, of conservative theology, of biblical literalism. And uh, because there just wasn't the, the education, I think, educational institutions was a key factor there, it had, really didn't affect the churches. Now, the Scopes trial seems like an anomaly, but it was largely uh, the, the, there wasn't all that much discussion about the anti-evolution, uh, and the Scopes trial was not, did not come out of great uprising from the from the populace. It was it was one of the ACLU's first test cases. Uh, just it was it really a put up case? Yeah, it was yeah. a it was a it was a put up case. And John Scopes was okay. I'll do it. They were sitting at the drugstore and said, you know, we'll do this and we'll do that. Okay. Yeah. I was wondering if you could speak about the role of the religion in the civil rights movement. Like, I know it's a huge topic. But I guess maybe the role of religion, did, did religion play a role in the politics of the civil rights movement? Certainly the black case. I mean, I'm just, mm -hmm. certainly, I mean, it's, it's <coughs> fundamental to the black religious sensitivity. I mean, the white church, on the whole, uh, is distressingly slow to sort of realize the issues. I think that's in part because of that, as I talked about, I think evangelicalism in the South tended to just talk about conversion and did not talk about very narrow moralistic. I mean, was, you know, you shouldn't curse. If you were prejudiced for blacks, that was a political issue. You don't talk about that, but don't curse. You know, so it was a very narrow moralistic kind of thing. And uh, there were some white church people who realized there was more to uh, religion than that, that, but they were very, very slow. I mean, it's, it's one of the kind of shocking things, how the one of the things that the Civil Rights Movement does, not only does it sort of in some sense liberate and empower black people, but after 15, 20 years, it begins to sort of wake the white church up to its sort of social responsibilities. But the white church, this is not a, it's not a good chapter in the history of uh, evangelical white church. It is worth noting now, though, that, that uh, some of the more interesting things going on with respect to improving race relations are going on among evangelicals. Yeah. They, they, they have been wakened up. Yeah. Yeah. Dustin, we'll definitely have one more question, but how long do you want this to go on? Uh, yes, let's just do one more question. Any more questions, you can take care of that at the reception. Okay, go ahead. How do you see the Democrats responding to these trends you're talking about? Do you see them trying to fight for white evangelicals, or do you see them hoping that the religious trend will push people and push less religious people into the Democratic fold, or how do you see them responding? 
Merrill. I think the the um, uh, a, a lot of American politics and, and a lot of modern Southern politics, I think, is is driven by the performance or non-performance of presidents. Uh, that seems to me the biggest biggest dynamic out there. So, um, for the Democrats to come back, the Republicans will have to be seen under the leadership of President Bush as having led the country into into disastrous positions, the foreign policy, economy, the economy, or whatever. If if that happens, it's possible. It's certainly possible. All I mean, I don't have any any uh, 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 any any um, any way to see the the future. It's certainly very possible. But you know, I can see the range from, from being total Republican difficulties uh, next year by the time the presidential election rolls around, or the, or the other way around, and, and probably somewhere you know in in between. But I think that that right now the, the the big problem for the Democrats, the biggest problem I see for the Democrats is that if we look at the rise of, of Southern Republicans, the the it, it's really among the youngest whites that the, that, that the Republicans have their greatest strength. It is not the other way around. And especially in the Deep South now, I would say, in terms of just political alliances of, of race being built into parties, the Deep South now is probably more more polarized by race than it has been for, for a long time. That's not true as, as much of some of the Upper South uh, states where black populations are smaller and where I think race has been perhaps less of a, less of a, of a, of a drive. But... Um, I think for the for the for the Democrats to come back, uh, one way to think about it is this: Bill Clinton had eight years of the White House. The time that he became president, Ronald Reagan had realigned the conservative whites. He'd taken them out of the Democratic Party over into a substantial Republican majority. That that trend has continued. So the conservative, the whites who call themselves conservatives, have realigned. And the whites who call themselves liberals are, are still over there in the Democratic Party, as you would, as you would expect. They, they haven't been, been moved. The key group up in the South, you think of four large building blocks, uh, <coughs> blacks overwhelmingly Democratic, closest thing to a constant in our politics, liberal whites overwhelmingly Democratic, conservative whites, predominantly Republican now, and I dare say more so now than, than you know, after Bush's election, uh, after 9-11, more so now than ever before. The big group that's 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 uh, that's up for grabs are, are the white moderates. Now, this is a group that 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 before Reagan was a huge Democratic asset. Reagan was unable to realign that group. That is, make most of them Republicans. What he did was de-align them. He took them from a huge Democratic surplus into a situation where they're more or less evenly divided between Democrats, Republicans, and Independents. So that's the group that's up for grabs. Now, think in terms of George Bush's campaign slogan, compassion and conservatism, okay? Think about it analytically. The noun is to hold the conservatives. The adjective, compassionate, is an attempt to attract the moderates. Now, it's hard to do for many of the reasons we've talked about here. The religious right is a huge turnout to, to, to many of these moderate independents in the South. It's a big problem. And as long as they are really a visible component of that coalition, that's going to be hard to, you know, to, 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 to transcend. But what Clinton did not do through his eight years in the White House was move those moderates back to a substantial Democratic majority. So from the standpoint of the Democrats, the Clinton presidency in the South, I think, was a big waste. Because he left office, he left office with an image, particularly among whites, conservatives, many moderates, that I think was a substantial advantage to George W. Bush in the 2000 presidential election. You know, when you have a presidential election in which the Democratic candidate, Al Gore, is from Tennessee, and the election in Tennessee is not really close, you know, it's not a, it's not a nip and tuck in Tennessee toward the end. All Gore had to do to win the White House was to carry his home state. That's the minimal, you know, criterion for a presidential candidate. He didn't come close to doing it. So... I think until events undermine Republican uh, efforts, particularly under under the leadership of a Republican president, it's going to be hard for the Democrats to come back. But I think I think race is a whole lot more important than Southern politics and religion. Interesting. Just one more thing that yeah. feeds a little bit what you're saying that uh, John Green and his colleagues at the University of Akron at the Ray Bliss Center, who do a lot of studying of evangelicals and their political views, is saying that. They're, they're, they think they are seeing a trend of what you were saying of not just in the South, though, 
that more moderate people are being are moving away from the that there may be a movement away from the Republican Party because they think it's becoming too overwhelmingly associated with the with the religious mm -hmm. right. So yeah. that could be a factor too. You know, you got you got the Deep South as one <clears throat> contrast between the the, the Northeast as as the, the 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 problems for the Republicans as they rise in the South are that outside the South in many areas, certainly in the, in the, in the Northeast, I think, as, as an example, and the Pacific Coast, uh, the image of the Republicans as too, too dominated or too under the thumb of the religious right certainly is a huge Democratic asset. But many of those states, the Democrats are so far ahead that that's, you know, you've got huge majorities, but you can only win 100% of the California's electoral vote, <laughs> whether it's you win by 70% or, you know, or, you know, or, or whatever. Uh, but that 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 is part of the reason why our politics, I think, now across the nation is is so tight, so polarized. Nothing's comfortable for either party. Okay, well, I uh, thank you for the student forum for uh, putting this event on, especially to the panel. <laughs> Everyone is invited to uh, the reception, which is out in the uh, foyer. Any valuable members of the Dean Church Party delegation come see me and have us this. Question.